welcome to TechShift F9. I am Maurizio Raffone, and this week, well, this week we're having a particularly fun chat with someone who's made a rather unusual career transition. But before we get there, I just want to talk briefly about success. Success can mean very different things to each one of us, and the pursuit of success, which sometimes we equate with the pursuit of happiness, can lead people down the wrong path and actually be a way towards having a sense of failure. Bear that in mind when you listen to this week's episode. Years ago, whilst working at an investment bank in Milan, a young lad joined our area. He was smart, driven, polished, and a joy to work with. But there was a problem. He loved wine. No, wait, not because he drank too much of it, but because his love for the fermented grape got him into studying for the qualification of professional sommelier in his spare time, and then convinced him to launch a wine business in Switzerland. He then became a senior fine wine buyer at Cult Wines, a wine investment company, and recently started a new position, which at the time of recording is still under wraps. Joining us from London, I'm very excited to have Andrea Marino on this week's podcast. Ciao Andrea, welcome to TechShift F9. It's great to have you here on the podcast. Ciao Maurizio, great to see you. Thank you for having me. So, Andrea, we have to start from the beginning here. You're an up-and-coming capital market specialist working with institutional investors in the foreign exchange and interest rate market. But at some point, the market turned, the situation in the bank you worked at wasn't as promising for your career, and you decided to take what was essentially a hobby into a full-time entrepreneurial role in the wine business. Walk us through your mindset at that time, and in particular, how you got comfortable with a big jump into a completely different business. So. As you know, when I when I started working in finance, I did in 2009. So from 2009 to 2012, it was a very exciting time because it was a lot of a high volatility. We had some huge market crashes, and I was post, just post Lehman. So it was it was quite an interesting world. And from 2012 until 2000, and let's say 15, the market started to kind of normalize a bit. And I was very, very lucky to work in a very high competitive environment. I started at BBVA in Spain, and then I moved to Unicredit in Milan. And working as an FX sales with institutional customers, it was uh, extremely motivating. But then uh, I was driven, but not as much as my real passion, it was wine. When I was at uh, university, I was working as a waiter sometimes. So my ex-boss told me, look, you should do the sommelier course. I did the sommelier course. And uh, when I did the sommelier course, then I realized that uh, I was really driven and I felt a lot of passion in, 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 in the wine. And the passion was just not about, you know, drinking wine or understanding wine. It was just, you know, talking about wine with customers, serving wine, talking with, with, with producers asking questions about how the wine was made. And it was very fascinating to me because it was a totally different world from what I've learned and I've studied and invested a lot of time. And so I decided to study a little bit more. I did some courses in English. And then when I was doing my classic mailing list in, in the bank, when you have to you know, give some news to your customers and clients, I was always writing something about the wine of the day or the wine of the week, but I was just explaining about that. And then, I mean, before doing the, my career shift, I, I was talking only about wines with my, with, my, with my clients. So it was just a, a way to get through them and to be a little bit more in line with, you know, which wine do you like, when do you drink it, which, which one do you remember. And so, yeah, I did, I did that. And then my mailing list reached an hedge fund manager who was a good friend of my colleague at uh, Unicredit. And then we started we're talking only about wine. And then one day, this hedge fund manager and my colleague, Jacopo, they came to me and they said, look, we bought a building in Switzerland. We don't know what to do. Why don't we start a wine bar? At the beginning, I was a little bit skeptical, I have to say. But then I decided to, to think about a little bit more what could be the possibility to, to assist them in, the, in opening the wine bar. And then I thought that, okay, the only way to do it is to, is to really give 100% of my time to this and totally shift my, my whole thing. At the time, I didn't have any family. I didn't have any wife. I didn't have any kind of responsibilities, which I would say kind of help. <laughs> right. <laughs> but it was quite intense. So we started, I remember, in uh, October 2016. 
and the time frame was very very small i mean we had to open the wine bar by christmas 2016 so we had only two months oh, wow. to organize everything from scratch and the only way to do it is to to be there 24 hours seven and uh, you know designing the whole wine bar having you know relationship with the suppliers and things and so that was the what what happened so i moved there and i naturally found myself in managing the wine bar which, which was great and from that, we decided to that, you know, the wine bar in a ski resort in Switzerland was, was a great start for running a little bit more scaled business, like, you know, importing wines, distributing to other restaurants. And it was good. I worked there for about four years and it was quite intense, different country, different language and different people. But yeah, it was quite, it was quite, quite motivating, actually. So you actually went through lots of changes, not just the career change, the location change, responsibility change. But one thing that I'm curious about, when I look at my own career transition a few years ago, I remember I had this lingering feeling of a little bit of mild sadness in a sense, because I knew there was an important chapter in my life that was closing. And although there was a new one, an exciting one opening up, I still felt something that was such an important part of my life was you know, ending and is making me feel a little bit strange. By the sounds of it, you were too busy to even think about any of that. But did you ever have this sort of mixed feelings? In- I had, yes, of course. I had a uh, lot of time. And because actually running a wine bar and running a, a distribution business of wine is very different from being on a desk in a very high competitive and environment like a trading desk in a bank. A trading desk, basically, you are flashed with news and calls and deals to make every basically every minute. So you really don't have the time to pause and think about something. There were some days where actually I was very, very stressed in the bank. And when I moved into the wine world, the wine world is a little bit more slow. Actually, it's quite kind of the opposite. So it takes a lot of time to get the customer. It takes a lot of time to structure a business. It takes a lot of time to even buy the wine. So once I was uh, dealing uh, on a, let's say, a very simple FX option, it just would just take less than two minutes to, you know, ask the, ask the traders, price it, sell it, and get the confirmation in under two minutes. To buy a pallet of wines, it would take something like uh, a week, probably, and without the logistics. So, you know, it's a totally different time scale. It's a totally different environment. And, of course, the, it's what I've learned in the banking, what I've learned in, the, in that uh, environment, I think it's uh, invaluable for my career. The thing that you have to be very precise, you have to be your own time manager. You need to stick to the deal. You need to stick to the terms. You need to really get into details of every single transaction because a very simple mistake in a bank could, could cause you and the bank millions of uh, euros. So you really need to be really, really precise. And as my mother said all the time, learn the art and put it aside. So I I don't I feel that the the banking area for in my career was very very important. I sometimes miss it, but the most of the time I don't. But just because it was a time back then there was the algo traders, a lot of platforms that were doing most of my of my job. So it was a little bit not that motivating anymore to me to sit there and just looking at the screen sometimes because it was an algo trader was doing. 90% of what I was doing, what I used to do, actually. So, yeah, with lo- less volatility in the market, it was a little bit less motivating. So if I would say the idea of working in a bank, 100% for me was, was great. I feel really, really grateful for, for, for having the possibility to, to be there. And I wish my, my children could experience that because it's, it's a fantastic environment. You, you have friends for life. It's it's great. It's a bonding environment. Yeah, I completely agree. And it's one thing I really appreciate about working in finance, particularly in a high intensity area like capital markets. So you can't just wait. You can't stand still. You have to push yourself, stay up to date, follow the market, get a feel for what clients are doing, new regulations and so forth. But what's really interesting what you just said is I sense that you're sort of feeling that something was moving away from what you were used to, what you were possibly looking ahead towards in terms of your career progression inside that environment. And so you sort of pushed yourself to educate yourself into a whole different sector. 
So what gave you that sort of insight? Were you, how were you able to step away from the day-to-day and actually realize that something was changing that could have possibly hurt your career prospects? Mm. Uh, I thought a lot about that. And I have to say that when I was working in a bank, sometimes I was kind of, you know, extremely stressed. So I had to have something outside the bank that could let me think and let me relax a bit. So I decided that extreme changes could give me some kind of benefits, some kind of reliefs. So I decided to be in the wine world with my own finances, like, you know, doing some events, working as a sommelier part-time while working in the bank. So sometimes there was a, some weekends I was working as a contractor sommelier for Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday in some restaurants. And there I was a little bit more exposed to the people working in the wine world. So I thought that with my edge of finance knowledge and an attitude towards the market, because at the end of the day, the wine world is nothing different than under any other products. You need to be really diligent in, in selling, in buying and selling. It's just, you know, it's just a business. And if you have the right fundamentals, like the one that I've studied in, in university or at a home bank, I think you can feel yourself at ease in any kind of, you know, transaction-driven world like the wine it is. The only way that I need to learn a lot was how to communicate the wine. And I, now I could develop a little bit more skills to be a little bit more at my ease in the wine world. And uh, I thought that spending more time with sommeliers, with people who were producing wines, with, uh, in, you know, doing some tours in the wineries, everything, you know, self-funded was, was, very, was very important. I did that. So I dedicated a lot of time. Spare time was, I was always on vineyards. I read a lot of books. I talked with a lot of people. And I think that what was the key for me to find the right path was talking with the people. Because what I... What I see is that the wine world is a little bit more flexible than the finance world, if we want to compare. The finance world, it's, you have uh, very little big career shifts, uh, while you have, if you start now, I would say that your career path is kind of already designed. So basically, you start as an as a internship, and you do analyst, associate, vice president, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. While in the wine world, you can move sideways a little bit more often. So, for example, I started in working as in a wine bar, then, with, then as a distributor. And then I moved to London, where I was a buyer for a large company, which they were selling the wine as an investment product. So what we were doing there, we were selecting some wines and selling the customers wines that could improve their, their quality and their price in a foreseeable future, let's say five, seven years. So basically you put some money in buying regional cases and in five, seven years, you will have more than inflation and almost on par with, let's say, seven, eight percent of growth. So it's, and then as a sideways as well, you can work as a, as a, as a consultant as well. For example, nowadays I'm working a little bit like a consultant for some wineries that they want to export the wines because they don't have many the knowledge of how the UK market works. They don't have the connections. They, some of them, they have a um, language barrier, which doesn't help. So it's always a very, very fascinating to me to find that there are always some needs that you can fill with your skills. I cannot fill all the, all the needs in the wine market, but there are some which are really transaction driven, which I can help many, many market participants, which I'm very happy to do that actually. That's great. And I mean, you talked about being a sommelier, which is, I think, very difficult. And I also think, that, at least in my experience, that quite a few people that do end up getting the certificate, they really park it aside and never really do anything with it. But you mentioned that you've pushed yourself, yourself to network more, to read up, take part-time jobs, not really for the money, but mostly for learning. So that upskilling and reskilling of your qualifications to move into the, the wine business were particularly crucial. Was there anything else that you did knowing you wanted to move into that new industry that was really helpful? I started from basically designing my career in the wine world from scratch because I started as a sommelier and as a waiter, basically, which is a very humble job, doing shifts from you know 5 p.m. until 3 a.m. in the morning while sometimes working in the bank during the day and uh, taking uh, all the risks and all the unnecessary side effects of working as a sommelier at night, which basically is a waiter. So I think it's a very humble and based job. But I think that uh, 
if any one of us would like to learn something new, it needs to start from really the bottom. So even moving cases, washing dishes, washing glasses, is fundamental to have a proper understanding how a new business works. I read many books about how many people really succeeded in their jobs. And, and I, for example, we have many examples in, in the world of different careers and different businesses, like, I don't know, you know, glasses or papers or mozzarella business, where people started from basically basics, you know, taking the milk from the cows or building the glasses by themselves. And then when you start from scratch, from basically from nothing, I think you really understand the whole process. And if you have a little bit of self-confidence, you start moving a little bit with ease, understanding where do you want to be. I remember that one of, one of the key important things is to make a plan and stick to it. And I am not the person that can really foresee a plan. I just make a plan once I see and understand something. When I, when I finished my university, I didn't have a plan. So I basically, I got the job because I thought that was the most important job sitting in a, in a, in a trading room, which was a, absolutely incredible job for me. And but then I, it, wasn't, it wasn't a plan for me. It was just uh, following other people's advices and following what other people were doing. And at the end of the day, in the long term, I was not at my ease. I was not myself. And while in the one world, you know, I see that myself is a little bit, I, I feel a little bit more confident because I, little, I feel that I can find myself a way to succeed. Being, I mean, successful in, in the banking industry, it's very easy. You have to be, you know, a managing director, you have to make a lot of money, and then you have to have at least 50 people around you. That's, that's the key of, to success in the, bank, in, the, in the banking world. In one world, it's very different. There are people who are successful because they can spot blind 50 wines. There are other people that can instead uh, be able to sell the wines at the right price. Or other people are successful because they are able to produce the same wine every vintage. Or some other people are very successful because they produce a very different wine, wine from the same vineyard every year. So, you know, the successful term, it's very different. And with this in mind, I feel a less pressure on my own career and on myself. Because once you are in a career path that you didn't design, which I didn't design actually, I felt that I was not really belonging to it. So one of the reasons, actually, it was very complex, but one of the reasons was also this one. So to, 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 to change a career. After you've made that change, something I'm curious about, and you came from a very different background to a lot of your new peers, right? So how did the wine industry accept you or deal with someone with your background and experience? I think that the wine world is very open and very welcoming because at the end of the day, I mean, if you start as a sommelier or as a waiter, I mean, there is no kind of competition. You can be anyone. And the thing is that, you know, doing the sommelier, a very basic job, actually, in Italy, and, or a waiter, after you studied to the Bocconi University, uh, working in a bank, it's, uh, it's a kind of, you know, shift Humble. back to when you were 16 years old. And when, right. I, when I said that to my father, he, he told me, I mean, you're crazy. I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> I mean, you, have, you have a fantastic job in a bank. And as you know, a job in a bank in Italy is seen as one of the you know, top jobs that you could ever have. So, yeah, it was quite tough. But then uh, I, I, I said to him, look, I feel at my ease here. I know which, which are my strengths. I know which are my weaknesses. And I think that I overcome this and be happy in the one world rather than the banking world. Of course, you know, I think that uh, the money are not the same. They will never be the same. But when I, f I, w I feel driven a little bit more working here in the wine world, because I love the people I'm working with, I love the producers, I love the products. And personally, I think that working with a real product is something that you can, you know, have in your hands and uh, exchange and also talk about in a, in a dinner, a lunch, or with some friends. Or even if you can bring a bottle to a friend's house instead of a foreign exchange swap, which you cannot do it, it's a little bit more easy to create a bonds with people, you know. And I feel that at, at the end of the day, we are, I think that 
from my own philosophy and from my own perspective, the world has to come to, you know, we are nine, nine, nine billion of people now. So we need to have the fundamental skills, which is communication and be together. And if you don't have that, I think you miss a lot of the, of the life, what life is. So I love to be with people, I love to play with people, I love to, you know, being surrounded by other people. And I think at the end of the day, the wine is just a bond that can accelerate the, the fundamental human interaction that sometimes, you know, we miss. I really suffered during COVID because, you know, there was no interaction, there was no dinner, right. there was no wine. Uh, I was very lucky that uh, I am very lucky that my wife, she's very supportive in this and she follows me in, uh, she followed me in Switzerland now in, uh, in UK. And, uh, but she realized that, I mean, at the end of the day, the happiness of a family comes through also to self-satisfaction, self-fulfillment, which is fundamental to, to every one of us. If somebody, if I don't feel, you know, happy with what I'm doing, that's no point in doing that. We have only one life at the end, Maurizio. So it's better that we enjoy that and we design by ourselves if we can and to be happy with every one of us. Amen to that. So Andrea, switching gears a little bit, the yeah. wine sector is almost as old as the world, right? I mean, I think I read somewhere that the oldest recorded wine is something like 7,000 years old. Um, yes. So as you said, it's a very traditional business. But now that you're in the wine business, since this uh, podcast uh, focuses a lot on technology, what's your view on the role that technology plays uh, in the wine market? I think technology is, is key to the wine world for different reasons. So the first one is that technology is, is a benefit for people who trade wines and for people who understand a little bit more what's going on in the wine. So there are ty different types of technologies. For example, the first technology which comes up to mind is the blockchain technology. And the blockchain technology is extremely helpful for people who like to build and to, un and to trace uh, high-end wines. High-end wines, I mean, some wines that really cost a fortune, let's say above 300 euros per bottle. And usually collectors and people who are fond of, you know, having some wine society, they are really interested in understanding where the wines come from, if the wine has been bought and exchanged at right hands. And the thing is that blockchain at the moment is not yet mature for the wine market, in my opinion. There are different platforms, there are different criteria, and there is a little bit of movement around uh, what should the wine trade and the wine world do with the blockchain. Because at the end of the day, the blockchain is, is very, very important until the wine became physical. So you can trace it until the last market participant can put his block in the blockchain. So let's say that from the winery until the last distributor, you can trace it. But then when exchange hands, when it goes into a house, it's very difficult to trace it back. There are many different things that technology can do. And I think that the most important thing is about where the wine is actually going to. There are plenty of platforms you know, in, in, in the wine world where they can offer you different data from producers, from suppliers, from buyers. And then you can really price your wines in a different way if you are a producer. You can buy the wine at the, at the right price. And technology is helping a lot in this because, you know, a 7,000 years old business there's nothing new, really, because, I mean, the wine is the same as it was, has been produced with a different way, but at the end, it's the same product. It's extremely refined now. There is very little error in making wines. There are no, not anymore any fault to wines. The investment in research and, and development of, you know, different uh, areas in the winemaking are huge. And, but at the end, it's a very simple business. You need to produce wine, sell the wines, and uh, communicate the wine in the right way. So, you know, technology is very, very important. And I see that the biggest shift in the future in technology will be regarding logistics, blockchain, and traceability. And uh, you'd mentioned that you're also now working in not just pure wine business per se, but also with an investment perspective or, you know, providing investment opportunities for people that are looking for specific 
diversification plays maybe in their portfolio. Was it always in your plans to eventually get back a little bit closer to the finance and investment world in your wine business experience, or was it a little bit unexpected? If I have to say it was a bit unexpected, because when I started the wine bar and the distribution was no investment in there. When I moved to London in UK, I discovered that many customers in UK, they buy the wines and they keep it aside and not drinking them because they are expecting that the wines will pick up in price. They will accrue a little bit of, you know, value because if you buy some high-end wines at a certain price, let's say when they are released on the market from the winery, then in 10 years' time, there will be not the same number of cases produced by the producer of that specific vintage. So for a very simple supply-demand ratio, there will be less wine in the market. So the people who like to buy that specific wine in that specific vintage has to pay a premium. So this is a very simple concept, but if you apply to the wine, you can call it an investment because you are betting that that wine will be consumed and then in 10 years' time, you will get a little bit reward for holding that wine. So the wine investment is, is a small part of the whole wine business. And it's quite interesting because it's, uh, it offers you the possibility to understand some dynamics in the, in, in the, in the wine business. Specifically, you need to address and understand the complex relationship between vintages, wines, regions, critic scores, and liquidity in the market. You know, the wine is a liquid, but it's not that liquid when you want to sell it. You really need to have, <laughs> you really need to have some people and some companies that really understand how the market is going. So let's say that you want to invest in wine. There are some key regions where Historically, they showed that they are very sensible to the supply demand, you know, <clears throat> force. Bordeaux, Champagne, Burgundy wines, and Napa Valley wines, and in some, for some extent, Barolo wines from Piemont and the wines from Tuscany. So these wines, which are really sought after, like the top chateau from Bordeaux, the top producers from from Burgundy, the top houses from from Champagne. They are wines that are worldwide really recognized as a brand. They have a high critic scores. They are consumed widely. They are produced in very small amount. So many people want that wine. And these wines are worth buying them because in, if you buy them, it's for sure that in 10 years' time, you will get something for holding that cases. But doing that, you are subject to understand the market. So there are some exchanges, fine wines exchanges, that uh, they can provide you with data, it asks spreads. And then when you, when you have the raw data, you can play a little bit you know, with volatility. You can, you can do some kind of you know, financial analysis. And it was a place where it was a business which I couldn't thought that was existing. But then when I sat on the desk as a buyer for this company called Cut Wines, I felt everything was in the right place because I was, you know, I was dealing with wine. I was dealing with investment. I was talking about, you know, we we had the daily briefing about how the market is going, how the macro environment of the market are are doing. We were talking about central banks. We were talking about wines. And from my side, I was talking about, you know, how is the vintage? How is the producer? How the wine is tasting? What the critics thinks? Where the wine is drink? And so... It was kind of natural for me, and it was it was great. I worked there for about three years in the house, almost four years. I I I, <clears throat> I decided to have another shift actually, and I had a chance to to work with a wine producer here in UK. As an Italian wine producer, he's launching a full scale wine distribution business with also wine investment branch, and he's very ambitious. We know each other since a long time, and then it was kind of natural to work with him. Well, congratulations, Andrea. And so Thank you. the last question for you is, is your experience in actually transitioning a career been something that has been of help in, well, this new change you just, you're about to make, I think by the time the 
the podcast is out, you've just literally just started the new the new role. So how perhaps has that previous transition helped you handle the one you're currently going through? I think it's I think that it's has been very helpful to me to work in different roles in the wine business. So I work in my career I work as a sommelier, as a you know director of a wine bar. A uh, distributor, as an importer, as a buyer, as a sales guy, and of course, you know, when you do all these kind of things, the drawback is that you do not uh, earn a lot of money, and you don't have a lot of time to dedicate to family and uh, people you care about. But I think that is the only way for me to learn uh, the basic of the wine uh, world, having a lot of network, leveraging on the network, and understanding where I could fit better. So I I think at the end of the day, it's just always it's a kind of, you know, investment. You trade time, you trade money, and you trade skills. And personally, I prefer to invest more time and be sure that the steps that I I would take eventually would have been the one that I could feel that my skills were up there and where where it could be used to, to, to make the best. And working as a buyer was great. I had the possibility to, you know, expand my network in the UK wine trade, which is the highest and the most tough competitive wine business in the world. The network there is huge. The London market and the UK market is incredible. It's probably leading uh, in Europe and is probably the fourth largest market in the world. And London is a very unique city. Nine million of people working there. Countless wine professionals working there. So the benefit of being there exposed to many of these people, I just literally grabbed as many information I could and uh, understanding what I could do. And I think that I was working as a buyer, which is not the highest paid job, it's not even the, you know, the best job, it's not a managing role, led me to understand better from a little bit more humble position, what could I do with my career? And it was very, very important for me. I think that what I would suggest is to always uh, look at yourself in the mirror and understand uh, what are your skills, what are your you know, weaknesses, and address them in a very humble way. Okay, I know that I'm not the strongest one in, in business plans or in managing finances, so I'm pretty sure that in the future I need to work towards that. And uh, it's very important for me to realize that. And I've read the many books, and I think that the books that helped me a lot was the one from Harvard Business Review, where they basically, there's not books, they are just, you know, a collection of articles and uh, how you manage your career, how you manage your, yourself. And uh, once I got in the, in the way of thinking, and we were talking about mindset before, that uh, every one of us can really change what they want, just basically changing by, the, by themselves. It's very important for me to understand what I'm doing wrong, what I'm doing good. Once I realize that, I move myself a little bit, a little bit more ease. So I think that, you know, the most important mindset from my experience is that to be, you know, on the back seat, understanding what's going on, and then make the move without uh, making the move. I mean, it's always, you know, uh, a risk-taking uh, uh, environment shifting career, but I mean, it's uh, this what it is, and I'm very happy to be here and, and talking about these things with you. And, uh, thank you so much for your time today. Wonderful insight. What is the best way for people to find out more about you if they want to connect? I have a LinkedIn account that probably Maurizio will link uh, to the podcast, and then I will drop my email as well. So, every one of you can write me an email. And I'm very open to talk about this because I think it's great that every one of us find a way to express their passion and, and, and at the end, reach their happiness. So feel free to contact me anytime you want. Thanks again, Andrea. Thank you, Maurice. Thank you for having me. Well, this brings this week's episode of TechShift F9 to an end. Thank you all for listening. Stay cool. Stay positive.